Hello, this is Dr. Tyler, and I thought I would do something a little different today. I thought I'd make one of these tier lists that I see on the internet. Uh, so let's make a ranking to see which of these things is important, which of these things is less important. All right, let's get going. And I'm going to start with regular old toothpaste. And I'm going to put this right up into A tier. So this is toothpaste, just like you'd get at the drugstore with fluoride in it. Uh, fluoride is helpful in that it binds to the minerals that teeth are made of, makes that mineral stronger, more resistant to cavities, uh, and it helps a little bit with that. Uh, it's not a huge game changer in that it's not going to take somebody who gets a lot of cavities and make them not get any cavities, but it's going to help a little bit. So my main problem with fluoride is really just that uh, some people have a problem with fluoride. I tend to think that it's safe and that uh, the risks are very, very low considering that it has some benefits, but there are people who disagree with me uh, and I wish they didn't. That's kind of the only thing I can say about fluoride. All right, let's keep going uh, and let's go straight into non-fluoride toothpaste and I'm going to put this in B tier. Um, so if I was going to you know, say what are the things in toothpaste that are helpful? You know, there's kind of, there's the fluoride that we just talked about. Uh, then there's also uh, abrasives that help clean stain off, help, uh, you know, disrupt plaque. And then there's also, you know, some sort of detergent, whether you want to call that a foaming agent or a surfactant or whatever. But there's something in there that's going to make the cleaning more efficient. Just like, I don't know, soap makes it more efficient, you know, when you're showering and, you know, dish soap makes it easier when you're scrubbing your dishes. Uh, you know, so basically that's, that's helpful. You know, this, uh, you know, non-fluoride toothpaste is not going to have fluoride, but it's still going to have all that other stuff. So it's still going to um, be certainly better than nothing. Uh, and let's go to, yeah, you know, I've talked about in my videos, this Stannis fluoride. Uh, I'm going to put this right up next to A tier. It's a type of fluoride. It's going to do all the other things that fluoride does with helping cavities, but it's also going to uh, have an effect on sensitivity, which is handy. A lot of people have sensitive teeth, and it's also helpful in that it likes to kill bacteria. And because of that, it helps, you know, manage bacterial loads in your mouth, helps minimize gingivitis. Um, those are pretty minor uh, effects. They're, it's not going to bump it up to, you know, all the way to S tier or anything like that, but it's handy. I, I personally use a Stannis fluoride toothpaste. All right, uh, let's go to no toothpaste. Yeah, no toothpaste at all. So just brushing, no toothpaste. You know, I wasn't even really sure that this was a thing. I was not even aware of this until I started, you know, getting some comments on my toothpaste video saying that you don't need toothpaste. Um, and, you know, I have gotten this a couple times from patients or friends saying, hey, do you, do you really need to use toothpaste? I'm going to say, yeah, you do. And I'm going to put this down in D tier. The reason why I don't like this is sort of like what I was saying before, is that, you know, toothpaste does have things in it that uh, beyond just fluoride that help us clean more efficiently. And just like, man, if you were trying to do your dishes without soap, it's just not the same. You're, it's going to take longer and the end result is just not going to be as good. And you know what? Beyond just being not as efficient, it's possible that it could be downright bad and that toothbrushes themselves are capable of doing damage. I mean, people do brush their teeth too hard and they cause damage to tooth structure. And I just have a feeling that if you weren't using toothpaste, you might increase the risk of doing damage. I don't know if that's true, but I suspect that. So certainly this is going to live down here in D tier. All right, uh, let's do this. Nano hydroxyapatite toothpaste. And I'm going to put this up into A tier, which is interesting because this, this is a fluoride free toothpaste. But Nano Hydroxyapatite is my favorite fluoride alternative, if you want to call it that. And to talk about how this works, let me talk about how, you know, cavities happen in general. You know, a lot of people think that, oh man, you have a bunch of sugar or something like that, and all of a sudden the cavity forms. But really, uh, you know, there's always damage being done to your teeth when you eat, but it's always a little bit of damage. And, you know, in between meals, our body, our saliva is capable of reversing that damage to heal it just a little bit. And we're constantly having this back and forth between demineralizing the uh, minerals that make up our teeth uh, and then remineralizing them, healing them. And it's really, we end up with cavities because that balance gets out of whack for some extended period of time. 
And so with fluoride, our strategy is, okay, we're gonna reset that balance by making us more resistant to damage so it's easy for our body to heal the little amount of damage that was done. Whereas something like this nanohydroxyapatite, um, hydroxyapatite is the mineral that teeth are made of, so this is really just tiny little bits of uh, tooth stuff, you know, ground up into toothpaste, and it makes uh, our body more efficient at healing the damage that was done by remineralizing the teeth. And so that's how this tries to uh, rebalance things out so that you don't end up with cavities. And the studies show that it does work. I mean, it's actually been approved as an anti-cavity agent in Japan for, you know, a couple decades. Uh, and, you know, you can import Japanese toothpaste that has it in it. And it's becoming more common to get in the United States. I think that this brand here is uh, Boca. Um, the only downside of this, I guess, let, let me say that there are two downsides. One is that even though there is clear evidence that this works better than you know, like just a regular non-fluoride toothpaste, uh, the evidence is not clear that it works as well as fluoride. So I would put a little asterisk question mark and maybe want to rank this slightly below fluoride. Um, the other thing is that it's more expensive. So you know, I think this is at least ten bucks a tube. Uh, you know, if you're going to import the Japanese toothpaste, uh, I think that's like sixteen dollars a tube. Certainly more than the five you would get for a Crest or Colgate. But that certainly might be worth it for those people that uh, you know don't want to use fluoride for some reason. And like I said, this is definitely better than nothing. Yeah, you know, and while we're on this topic, let me just throw up Biomin C up here. Uh, and I'm going to put this right next to this up in A tier. Biomin this works in a very similar way to the nanohydroxyapatite. Biomin has been available in the UK for a couple years now, and it's just recently become available in the United States just a couple years ago. Now this Biomin C does not have fluoride in it. I think it, they do make a fluoride version, but I think that's a prescription only toothpaste. But this has stuff in it that uh, is gonna help with sensitivity, just like the nanohydroxyapatite. I'm not sure if I mentioned that it helps with sensitivity, but this also has that remineralization effect that's going to help uh, balance out the your risk for cavities. All right, let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about this this black toothpaste, this charcoal toothpaste. Uh, you know, I think a lot of dentists would put this directly down into D tier. A lot of dentists say that uh, charcoal toothpaste is just too abrasive and it's going to cause damage to teeth. I'm going to go against the grain of most dentists here and say that the evidence that this is too abrasive I don't find particularly strong and so I would assume that this is pretty similar to just any old uh, non-fluoride toothpaste if you're going to get a non-fluoride version of charcoal toothpaste. You can get some with fluoride in it. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but really, I would think about this as just an alternative abrasive. Most toothpaste are going to use some sort of silica as the abrasive, where this is going to use charcoal. Charcoal has a lot of other claims in terms of its whitening claims, in terms of its sort of detoxifying effect and some other things like that. I would say that I'm not impressed by its whitening claims. It's really just gonna uh, do some, you know, remove some surface staining, just like any other abrasive in toothpaste. In terms of its detoxifying claims, uh, I mean, you can watch my charcoal video to hear my full thoughts on that, but uh, I, don't think there's a lot to that. In terms of fluoride mixed with charcoal, one thing that charcoal does is it binds to some drugs, some agents, and neutralizes them. So, you know, like they're, they're stuck to the charcoal and they pass through you rather than, you know, being absorbed in the body where they can do their thing. And so in this case, if it's mixed with fluoride, there is a risk that the fluoride is going to bind to the charcoal rather than to your teeth, and a fluoride toothpaste is going to be less effective than it would be just on its own. So that's something to think about. I've not read any studies to show how big that effect is, but it's certainly plausible, something to think about. Okay, let me just stick with the whole toothpaste train here, uh, and let's talk about neem. Uh, I'm going to put this in B tier. If you've never heard of neem, uh, I had not heard of Neem until just recently, uh, until I started this channel and started seeing a lot of comments to my toothpaste video about Neem. So Neem is a tree. It's a tree that uh, I think is found in India. Well, it's found in a lot of places, but I think it's been used in traditional medicine in India and around there uh, for all sorts of things. In fact, um, you know, like every different part of this tree, the, the bark, the twigs, the 
the leaves, the flowers, every single thing is sort of uh, separated, extracted, and then used for different things. Uh, and traditionally, the twigs were used to chew on, and that was thought to help prevent cavities or prevent oral problems. So is there something to that? Uh, maybe, I would say that, because you know there is uh, an effect of the, the neem oil that you can get, which I'm sure is put in a toothpaste, that uh, is an antibacterial. So it, it would help kill the bacteria. And if you're gonna be chewing on these twigs all day long, um, that might have an effect to manage uh, plaque loads and also help minimize the risk for cavities, maybe. Um, I can imagine that there's, you know, maybe some downsides to chewing on sticks. I don't think Dennis would uh, necessarily recommend that, but uh, you know, hey, you can get it in toothpaste form. Now, I'm not a huge fan of antibacterials in toothpaste. I wouldn't say that I'm not a fan of it. I mean, like I mentioned Stannis fluoride, that's an antibacterial, it helps with gingivitis. It's just that it doesn't, it's not gonna have a huge effect. It might help with gingivitis, um, but it, probably is not going to have effect on cavities and gum disease, which are things that I'm more concerned about because that's going to cause more damage to teeth. Uh, I would think about this as maybe having an effect similar to maybe stannous fluoride uh, without the sensitivity um, and maybe something like, you know, like a mouth rinse, like a Listerine or something like that. Uh, so it's certainly not going to boost it, you know, a tier above just regular non-fluoride toothpaste. All right, what about homemade toothpaste? Yeah, I'm gonna put this in C tier. And of course it's hard to say because there's lots of different you know recipes out there of how you could make homemade toothpaste. For the sake of this, let me just say that maybe you can take some uh, coconut oil and then mix in some baking soda, maybe as an abrasive, and then you could put some xylitol as a sweetener, and then maybe uh, like some mint oil as a, you know, a flavorant. And there you got some homemade toothpaste. You know, that's certainly better than nothing. I mean, it's gonna have that abrasive in it. And, and you know, a baking soda is a very mild abrasive, so it might not be all that great at removing stain, but it's, it's certainly gonna be better than nothing. And, you know, those other three ingredients, the xylitol, the coconut oil, and the mint oil all have antibacterial effects. So that's gonna be helpful at managing plaque and gingivitis. I will say the one thing that this is missing is that uh, that surfactant, that detergent, that that agent that's going to be in a lot of toothpaste that helps make the cleaning more efficient. So that's the one thing that I would make it bump down into the C tier is just because it's not going to have that. Other than that, I mean, it's it, it's fine. It's certainly better than nothing. It does seem like fun making your own toothpaste. Uh, if I was not a dentist and I didn't know that that was not probably a very effective thing to do, I would think that was a lot of fun. I would probably do it myself or at least give it a try. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Um, I just mentioned xylitol, so let me talk about that. So like I mentioned, xylitol is a sweetener and it's handy in that not only uh, bacteria not eat it, so it's not gonna make cavities, but bacteria actively don't like it. It makes bacteria stop growing. And because of that, uh, it can be helpful you know, with oral health. And so uh, there are toothpaste, like there are some natural toothpaste that make a big deal about having xylitol in it, like that's gonna help a lot. Like I said, I, I don't think that that's gonna make a huge difference. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, toothpaste is at best, if you're a really good brusher, you're gonna be brushing for four minutes a day. Uh, but four minutes is not a ton of time for an antibacterial to work in your mouth. I think it's more helpful in this form right here. This is a gum. And so like if you're chewing a gum or sucking on a lozenge, something like that, it's gonna have much more uh, time to work in your mouth as an antibacterial. And that's gonna maybe have a bigger effect. But the main reason why I like this, why I may bump this up into A tier, I haven't decided yet, okay. Is that if you have a dry mouth, and a lot of people do, that really affects your risk for cavities uh, because your saliva is capable of you know, rinsing away food debris. It's also helpful in buffering acid, repairing the damage it's done during meals. And so if you have a lack of saliva because of, uh, you know, you have, there are some conditions that reduce your saliva load. Um, there are some medications that reduce your saliva load. A ton of medications do that. Maybe you had cancer and you had radiation in one of your saliva glands. I see that a lot. Um, if that happens to you, Man, it, it, this can be really helpful because not only is it fighting bacteria, it's also helping to stimulate the saliva glands that are there and hopefully making you produce more saliva. It's really, really helpful. So 
man, if that's you, if you have really limited saliva, man, maybe this is S tier. Um, in fact, because of that, I'm gonna balance it out and I'm gonna put in a, a tier. It's definitely not necessary for most people, but for those people with dry mouth, this is a really helpful thing to do. Um, okay, let's talk about oil pulling. Uh, if you are unaware of what oil pulling is, it's when you take some coconut oil in your mouth and you swish with it for 10 minutes, which seems like a long time. <laughs> I mean, I've never done it. I, it probably would feel like a long time, but people do this and they say that it's uh, gonna help clean your mouth, detoxify things, that sort of thing. I'm gonna put this down in D tier. I'm not a fan of this. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, Coconut oil does have an antibacterial effect, so it is gonna be helpful in killing bacteria, managing um, plaque loads. 10 minutes is a long time for it to be in your mouth, so that it might have uh, an effect there. And as you swish with it, um, it's gonna foam up, and that's gonna be really good at disrupting plaques, basically cleaning your teeth. The reason why I put this down into D tier is just because I don't think this is gonna have any effect better than just brushing your teeth normally. I mean, like, basically this is just, you know, foaming up coconut oil and swishing it around to disrupt plaque. I mean, like, the studies show that it is capable of doing that, but certainly not anything beyond that. Um, and it just seems like such a harder thing to fit into your daily routine, swishing with coconut oil for 10 minutes. It doesn't sound like a pleasant thing for to do to me. That's my opinion. But, you know, if this is you know, you and you love doing it, then uh, go for it. People do say that this is gonna have a detoxifying effect. I, man, I certainly have not read anything to convince me that that is something that is gonna help you out. But uh, yeah, so because of that, I would say this is just a, a crappy way to clean your teeth. It's not gonna have really a lot of effects beyond that. And so that's why I'm gonna stick it down into D tier. All right. Um, getting a checkup. So this person is getting their teeth cleaned, maybe a checkup. Um, you know, this is recommended to do every six months. I'm going to put this up into S tier. Yeah, this is really helpful. Maybe not for everybody. And I mean that in that there are probably some people out there that do go a long time, you know, like longer than six months. Maybe they go a year or two and then come back and they got away with it. I mean, they don't get cavities. Like there's a lot of people that Maybe their genes or their habits are so good that they just don't end up with a lot of cavities. They don't end up with gum disease, but that's not everybody. So if you're somebody who does get cavities, it's certainly handy to you know come in, get your teeth checked, have x-rays taken to see if there's any new cavities so that we can fix them early. And then there's also those people with gum disease. And for those people, this is really important. Um, one, because we wanna catch gum disease early, like hopefully when you're in your 20s or early 30s. I mean, that's, that's when you first start to see the signs of gum disease. And so it's important to know that about yourself early. And you know, when you have gum disease, the, the thing that happens is that uh, you get tartar buildup underneath your gums and that creates this process of inflammation. Uh, there's infection there that deteriorates the bone around your teeth, which leaves a bigger pocket for tartar to build up and, and bacteria to hang out into. And so it's this vicious cycle that ends up deteriorating the bone and the gums around the teeth. And that can, over a long period of time, completely make teeth loose and people lose their teeth that way. The really terrible thing about this is that this can be happening where you're causing huge damage to your teeth and you don't even know it's happening because a lot of times uh, you don't end up with any symptoms until it's really far along where it's uh, really too late maybe. So that is why it's really important to go get your checkup, not only to know about it, but once you have that tartar, uh, you know, it's hard and you, you can't brush it away. You can't floss it away. You have to have it scraped away by the hygienist. And so if that's you, the really only way to manage gum disease is to go see your hygienist, your dentist, you know, sometimes every three or four months, but at least every six months to have that tartar removed and to have a cleaning. So like I said, so, you know, for some people, maybe this is just a tier, but for those people with gum disease, this is, man, S plus. This is really, really important. All right, let's talk about uh, your diet. This has a, a bunch of uh, soft drinks in here, some sugary drinks, that doesn't look good, and I'm gonna put this in S tier. Your diet is really important, especially for cavities. So if you're someone who struggles with having more cavities than you would like, 
a lot of people focus on, you know, like when you, when you go to your dentist and you get a new cavity, you know, you're going to get a lecture about brushing and flossing and all that sort of stuff. But that stuff is important. It's not as important as your diet. Uh, I would say the biggest thing for managing cavities is making sure that you limit your exposure to sugar. And not necessarily like the amount of sugar. I would say that that's probably not the way to think about it. I would say it's more important to limit the number of exposures, the number of times a day that you have sugar. Because what you're gonna do is that as you have some sugar, you are feeding the bacteria in your mouth. And as those bacteria are fed, they uh, you know, basically they turn on, they're activated, and then they're at work making cavities for the next 15 minutes or so. And so what can happen is if you know you're if you have a habit of sort of sipping on sugary drinks, and that could be a that could be a soft drink, it could be juice, an energy drink, coffee with sugar in it. I've, see, I've seen all of those things. Um, man, you could if you're doing that throughout the day, you just get into this situation where all day long uh, bacteria are eating away at your teeth. And you know you're never giving your body any chance to remineralize to heal those that damage that's being done. It it can really wreck a mouth, and I've seen this a lot. Where um, you know by the age of 25, if someone starts this habit early on when they're a teenager, man, they've just destroyed their mouth. Um, and so that can be a, certainly a severe case of that. But even if you don't have a severe case where you're gonna completely wreck your mouth with cavities, it's still worth thinking about your diet, even if you just wanna have fewer cavities than you are currently having. All right, let's look at electric toothbrushes. If you've seen my electric toothbrush videos, you know I'm a fan of these. I'm gonna put it up into S tier. Uh, yeah, brushing is a great thing to do. And electric toothbrushes just make you way better at brushing your teeth. And brushing does come with some downsides. It is possible to brush too hard to cause damage that way. And there are electric toothbrushes that help with that. They have sensors on there to prevent you from brushing too hard. I think that's great. Uh, it's one of these things where it's just an easy thing to recommend. I will say don't spend any more than $50 or you don't have to spend more than $50 on these things because um, you know, with that, you're probably going to get a good electric toothbrush with a sensor on it. I'm not a fan of the Quip. I'm not a fan of any of the ones that take uh, replaceable batteries rather than something that is rechargeable. I find that that is a pretty good generalization about these things. Something like a Sonic Hair is great. Um, not that, not that like the Quip is terrible. It's just like it's not as good as something like a Sonic Hair or an Oral B, something like that. All right, floss. All right, so this is like the main thing that dentists like to nag people about is to floss more. Uh, so I'm gonna put it in S tier, right? Uh, no, maybe A tier. You know what? I'm gonna put flossing in B tier. Okay, so let me talk about flossing. Now, you may have seen some headlines a couple years ago. There was this big meta-analysis, this big study that looked back at years of research to see if uh, there was any good reason to floss and they came back and said, you know what? There's not any really great reason to floss. Uh, you know, it didn't seem to help prevent cavities. It didn't really seem to help prevent gum disease. That was really surprising because, you know, if you know how cavities form, you know, like it, it, they form where plaque sits. And if you're allowing plaque to sit between your teeth, certainly that's going to help make cavities. But at least in this study, they did not find that. I would say that I don't think that I, I would push back against that study and then say that there, there is still a good reason to floss. But I will accept that it could be that floss is just not as effective. It's not as important as, let's say, brushing well. Maybe that's true. Um, and I think that there's maybe a couple reasons for that. One is that uh, flossing is you know, very technique sensitive. It's it's hard to do right. And so, you know, not only maybe some people aren't as maybe truthful about saying that they floss and maybe some people are flossing and just not very good at it. Also, you know, it could be just that it's really hard to design a study that really shows the effectiveness of flossing. But, you know, I'll tell you what, I mean, the best flossers in the world are not dentists, actually, it's hygienists. It's the people that see the gross stuff between everybody's teeth. Uh, so I would maybe think about it this way, um, because I do think that maybe there's some beneficial effects, but, you know, at, in the end of the day, like, you don't need a study telling you to 
shower every day like you shower every day because like gross that's why because like you you know that it's better to be clean think about it the same way there is gross stuff between your teeth and it would be nice to get it out of there and that's why i think hygienists are such good flossers because like they see that nasty stuff all day long and they're like i don't want that between my teeth so even if this doesn't have any effect at all which i do think it does at least there's that Okay, uh, let's talk about fluoridated water. Uh, and I'm gonna put this up into S tier. I'm tempted to put this lower just because uh, I think this is a little misunderstood, but I'm gonna keep it in S tier. Now, the main reason why I think this is a little misunderstood is because this really only has an effect, fluoridated water, um, when your teeth are forming. So it's really only effective for kids. For, for people who are young and their teeth are still in the process of being made, like where their body is actively laying down new layers of enamel or dentin. Uh, and because of that, uh, the fluoride can be incorporated into the enamel, into those two structures, and hopefully make those teeth more resistant to cavities like for someone's entire life. So that's really handy. Uh, but once the teeth are formed, like once you're an adult, uh, you know, I'm not sure how effective this is going to be. I mean, the dose of fluoride in water is so small that I don't think it's going to have any effect, like, topically. So, you know, when we think about fluoride, you think about is systemic fluoride, where, like this, where you're drinking it, you're eating it, or you're thinking about uh, topical fluoride, which is more like toothpaste, where we're really just, we're not eating toothpaste, we're just allowing it sit on our teeth um, to make them stronger. So this systemic fluoride is really just for kids. After that, then we rely on like a topical fluoride like that. So um, this is not gonna do anything. This is like a D tier for adults, but it's S tier for kids. And honestly, like when you're, when you're looking at it that way, it is like one of the greatest public health things that you could possibly do in terms of it's a very cheap thing to do and it has huge benefits for someone's entire life. The only downsides is like people don't like fluoride. I wish they did, but uh, some people don't. All right. All right. Your genes. What do they play in all this? Uh, and I'm going to say not just genes, but maybe everything that's kind of outside of your control. And I'm going to put this up into S tier. Uh, I mentioned that um, you know some people are prone to cavities, some people are prone to gum disease, and that is absolutely true. I mean, there is a genetic factor for uh, gum disease. Um, there's also, when your teeth are formed, perhaps they were formed in a way that they were made more susceptible to cavities than another person. Like maybe you uh, had a bad fever when you were like two years old, and that meant that those teeth that were being formed at that time, the enamel didn't form correctly or, or something like that. that. That certainly does happen. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to this. Some people are just more prone to cavities, more prone to gum disease than other people. It's unfair. It sucks. Uh, but the main thing to think about is that even if that's you, man, you can still overcome a predisposition for that stuff by doing everything else right, by managing your diet, by coming getting your teeth cleaned, by flossing and brushing correctly. It just is a little unfair in that you're gonna have to work a little harder than other people, but this is definitely an S tier thing here. All right, mouth rinse. Uh, you know, I'm gonna put this in C tier, I think. You know, a lot of people have asked me to do a video about uh, mouth rinses and maybe explaining those. And the reason why I've kind of resisted doing that is because there's not a lot to talk about. I would say that mouth rinse at a whole is one of the least important things that we can do. But, you know, like if you look at something like Listerine, there is an active ingredient. It's a mint oil and it has an antibacterial effect. So if we switch with it, it's going to minimize uh, you know, your plaque levels and it's going to hopefully um, help with gingivitis. And it has been shown to do that. The, only, the main reason why I put it down here is that it doesn't have a huge effect beyond just with gingivitis and it doesn't, it's not going to help with cavities. It's not going to help with gum disease. Uh, and you know, those are the things that I care about more than just, uh, gingivitis. You know, if you, if you only have but so much energy that you're going to put into helping your teeth, I would say that there are more important things that you can do. Now, there are beneficial things for this. I mean, like they do make mouth rinses with fluoride in them, um, which can be helpful if you're trying to increase your exposure to fluoride, uh, especially like after lunch, say, if you don't want to brush your teeth after lunch and you just want to rinse with the fluoride rinse, 
I think that's a fine uh, addition to your hygiene regimen. It's just not absolutely necessary. I would say that if you're gonna get a mouth rinse, I would recommend getting one without alcohol. Um, so the alcohol-free kind, uh, I think it's called Listerine Zero. There's a bunch of them. Um, uh, alcohol not only dries your gums and can have effect that way, it, uh, there, it has been shown to be linked to some oral cancers. So um, for that reason, I would say just stick to the alcohol-free kind. All right, this person is wearing a night guard. And I'm going to put night guard B or A. You know, I'm going to put it in A. Uh, in general, dentists love night guards. But, you know, there are so many people out there that grind or clench their teeth and just don't even know it. I mean, I feel like one of the most common arguments dentists get in with patients is to tell them, hey, you grind your teeth. And a, dentist, and a patient is like, no, I definitely don't do that. When like, let me tell you. It's pretty obvious typically when someone grinds their teeth. I mean, you know, sometimes when you grind your teeth, you can wear them down, which maybe you're not going to like the aesthetic appearance of, or maybe you're going to expose dentin and make the teeth sensitive. I've seen people that uh, grind their teeth down so far that they need root canals because they've exposed their nerve channel. That's that's a severe case. Uh, it can also uh, make teeth sensitive. That's actually, I would say, probably even more common than um, you know, grinding teeth down to, to the point where it's an aesthetic problem. Um, also, sometimes people clench their teeth and that can cause problems at the gums. It can cause recession. It can also cause cracks in the teeth. You know, people can sometimes lose teeth because uh, the teeth are cracked in a way that can't be repaired. So there's lots of good reasons to use uh, a night guard. It can also uh, help with jaw problems, with muscle problems. That can be another consequence of grinding your teeth. So um, not everybody grinds their teeth, so not everybody wants to wear these things. They're maybe hard to get used to for some people, but I wear one every night and uh, man, I, I kind of like it. I don't like sleeping without it. All right. Let's talk about uh, dipping or maybe not dipping. How important is not dipping? Well, uh, dipping is gross. <laughs> so like that's a pretty good reason not to dip. Uh, but uh, you know, beyond that, how about just with oral health? I I'm actually going to put this uh, maybe B tier, somewhere between B and C. Um, like I said, th there's plenty of good reasons not to dip. Uh, the main oral health reason is that when you dip, it makes your gums look weird. So like typically it's really easy for a dentist to see because it makes the gums sort of whitish and wrinkly. Uh, and so like sometimes you can, you know, move the dip around in such a way, or if you don't do it that often, it's not, it's not that hard to tell, but most of the time it's really obvious. Um, it, it tends to go away when you quit. So like, let's say you quit and you know, you, uh, you wait a couple months, typically the gums go back to normal, but uh, there is a concern that, oh, may, maybe that weird looking gum is precancerous. It, it does turn out that it's very, it's a pretty low risk. It, it tends to not be precancerous very often, but you know, that risk is there. I think that's mainly used just to scare patients into quitting <laughs> than anything else, but um, I, I suppose there is that risk. It's also probably not great for the gums there. I know that if you do like, uh, if you have recession in that area and you need to um, have gum grafting or you need some uh, gum work done in general, you're probably gonna wanna quit dipping first. So, you know, and get the gums back to normal then you're going to want to do that. So uh, that's certainly something to think about. But I would say that the oral health reasons not to dip are not as strong as the just general uh, grossness reasons not to dip. All right. How about smoking? Uh, so, you know, in terms of your general health, I would say smoking is like S plus. I mean, it's like one of the, the main things that we know is like smoking is bad. Uh, but for oral health, I think it still is S tier, probably uh, A or S. Uh, I think there's this preconception that smoking is just all around bad for the mouth. Um, but I, I would say it's only bad in some ways where you know it's going to stain your teeth. There's, you know, like tar is going to deposit on the teeth and creates a stain. That's going to clean off, but maybe you're not going to like the appearance of that. Uh, but it's not going to have an effect on cavities. So it's like if you smoke, you're, you're probably not end up with more cavities than you would otherwise. The main issue is with your gums. It is going to affect gum disease. It's going to make you more likely to have gum disease and it's going to make the gum disease 
harder to control if you're a heavy smoker. Uh, it also makes healing more of an issue. So uh, if you need an extraction, it makes the healing slower. If you need bone grafting or an implant, it makes those things less likely to be successful. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to quit smoking if you're having gum disease or other problems where like you need to replace teeth, things like that. All right, prescription toothpaste. Um, so yeah, sometimes if you have really bad cavities, you your dentist will prescribe you a toothpaste. Uh, and I'm going to put this in A tier, mm, maybe S tier. I don't know. Like, so this is going to have maybe five times the amount of fluoride as a regular toothpaste. And I would say that regular toothpaste has just the bare minimum amount of fluoride to make a difference. Just barely. Yeah. Whereas this is going to be uh, a, a definitely a big difference in uh, making it so that you get fewer cavities. Um, and I mean, I, st I still think it's going to be A tier because, you know, for those people that get tons of cavities, this is going to help, but it's only part of the picture. I mean, f for, for those people, your diet is going to be really the thing that's, that's going to help you out. This is just going to be something that helps, helps a little bit but it still takes a backseat to your diet. Um, all right, this is an interesting one. Uh, how important is changing your toothbrush every three months? Uh, I'm gonna put this in D tier. <laughs> okay, mainly I, I mainly put this in D tier because this conversation sort of annoys me. Uh, I mean, I feel like you see this the most when um, there's these uh, subscription services where, you know, you buy an electric toothbrush and then they're going to mail you a new head every two or three months or something like that. I think that that is overkill. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, they say that, uh, you know, dentists agree that this is how often you should uh, replace your toothbrush head. First off, dentists don't know anything about this. Like, we are only taught about this by toothbrush ads like there is no time in dental school where there's a lecture on replacing toothbrushes that's just not a thing in dental school we're learning like how to drill into a tooth without messing it up like that's what we're learning we're not learning about this stuff i would say most of the things that i talk about on this channel are not things that dentists are really thinking about much um so the, the reason why this whole conversation kind of annoys me is not because it's not worth replacing your toothbrush when it gets all bent up like that. Uh, because if you can see in this toothbrush, like this is a new toothbrush and this is a toothbrush that's, man, it looks like you've been scrubbing the floor with it. So if your toothbrush looks like this, you should replace it. Um, the reason why this bothers me is that if your toothbrush looks like this, replacing your toothbrush is not the most important problem you have. The most important problem you have is that you're brushing your teeth too hard. So if you brush your teeth properly, your toothbrush should never look like this. Um, so I find that the people that are like the best at replacing their toothbrush are people that brush their teeth too hard. Um, really, you should be using a soft brush and still, it should still look nice and new after three months, four months, after six months. In fact, I think a better way of um, knowing if you need to replace your toothbrush is, you know, like a lot of a lot of times toothbrushes will have these bristles that are dyed blue. And as you use them, the blue will fade. And once it's faded halfway or something like that, um, it's time to replace your toothbrush. I mean, like I use a Sonicare and the Sonicare heads, even like the generic Sonicare heads, I think, have that, you know, faded strip, the, the blue strip. You know, I, I think around six months is probably uh you know a good amount of time to replace your toothbrush maybe like maybe a little longer than that but around that i would say that if your if your toothbrush ends up looking uh, all messed up before that it means you're brushing your teeth too hard um now there is a concern like uh, maybe if you got sick you know you want to change your toothbrush head you know because you don't want to reinfect yourself uh yeah that's i mean that seems smart um, the CDC does recommend that, uh, but although if you do look up on the CDC, they will say that like, they don't think that's ever happened. Like, or at least they've never documented a case where someone has reinfected themselves through their toothbrush. So I don't know how big a deal that is. Honestly, I feel like, uh, the more important thing is to like, make sure you're, you keep your toothbrush clean. Uh, like bacteria 
if there is bacteria hanging out on the toothbrush where it's going to reinfect you, it's going to be uh, in the like toothpaste residue that gets stuck on your toothbrush. And maybe you know who you are that are not doing a great job of cleaning your toothbrush. Or I bet you your spouse knows who you are. Like I'm sure that there's a lot of you out there that like looks at your spouse's toothbrush, your significant other's toothbrush, and are like, that is disgusting. <laughs> like... Basically, I think it is a good idea. More so than focusing on this, I would say focus on not brushing too hard and cleaning your toothbrush well. I think that those are more important messages. And so even though you know changing your toothbrush might even be C tier, I'm dumping it into D tier just because, like I said, the whole conversation annoys me. <laughs> All right, and finally, uh, this is like a water flosser, like a water pick or whatever. Um, Although, like, I feel like I call all of these water picks, even though that's just one brand. Uh, I'm going to put this up into B tier. You know, there are a lot of flossing purists out there that are like, no, 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 water pick is not as good. You got to you gotta do the real thing. You got to floss. And, you know, there is some truth to that. I mean, I think that if you've got really uh, good, healthy gums, um, flossing is certainly better. The main issue with flossing is that it's really technique sensitive. And so it's hard to do it really well, especially once you start having bone loss. Like, so once you have gum disease initially, like there's more of a space for like stuff to collect. And so it's harder to clean it out, I find, with um, with just floss. Also, like if you have a bridge, you gotta like thread the floss underneath of it. I think that people just don't tend to do that very well. And if even if they do, like, I don't know how good a job they're gonna do. Uh, and with implants too, like flossing around implants is a little trickier than flossing around natural teeth. And so there's a lot of situations where flossing is just tougher. And so like, maybe if you're a hygienist and like you really know how to do that stuff really well, you're gonna, you're still gonna do a better job than with a water pick. But I think for most people out there, in a lot of situations, they're gonna do a better job with the water pick than they would with floss. That's my guess. So like a part of me kind of wants to bump this up a little higher than, than floss, but uh, I'll just stick it in the same tier as flossing. The main downside, like the reason why I don't use a water pick, is just cause like they kind of make a mess. Uh, and like, I feel like I get annoyed having to constantly refill the water uh, thing. I will say, this is a complete tangent, but water pick used to make a thing that attached to your shower head so like you could uh you know like water pick in the shower and you never had to refill it because it was being filled by your shower that thing was awesome i'm sure they stopped selling it because they found out that like i don't know it got gross <laughs> like there, there must have been a good reason why they stopped selling that thing but I gotta say, it was pretty great. I will say, if you're gonna do one of these things and you should do one of these things, uh, I find that most people are more interested in using a water pick every day than flossing every day, but it is a good idea to do one of these two things. All right, that's it. I'm out of things to put in a tier. If you uh, can think of other things that, that should have been you know, in this ranking, then put it in the comment and I'll let you know what I like, where I would have put it. I hope you enjoyed this. I mean, like I said, this is a little different than I've been doing mostly. I thought this might be a fun thing to do. It might be an, e an easy thing to do. Um, a fun excuse to talk about a bunch of this nonsense. So if, uh, if, you, if you liked this, let me know. And uh, otherwise, maybe I'll finally get around to making some of these other videos I've been planning on making. I've like written so many scripts for videos. Like I've got a whole script about nanohydroxyapatite. I've got scripts on like a meme. I've got like scripts on so many things. I just like am too lazy to actually like film myself making the videos and then edit them. It's like making it, having a YouTube channel is like a lot of work. It's fun, but it's, it's, there's a lot to it. All right, I'm gonna stop complaining here. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.